I wanted to kick off by honoring uh, Tangata Whenua, so the indigenous people in Aotearoa where I'm speaking to you from. On my journey of gender recognition, I've come to recognize that it's on the backs and the work of a whole lot of indigenous activism that I have the privilege to talk about this today and to come to an understanding of my, my gender. I wanted to acknowledge that I'm on I'm colonized land in Ototahi, Christchurch. I'm Jasper Lior, and this is Gender Euphoria, the podcast where we break down what gender euphoria is and talk about the beautiful, wonderful, incredible parts of trans identity. I want to acknowledge that the trans experience is complex and diverse. This podcast is not a comprehensive representation of that experience. Each episode, I chat to a beautiful human about their beautiful gender. Today, I'm joined by Carrie Donovan Brown. Carrie is a writer, a dinosaur enthusiast, and a big floppy golden retriever lion hybrid. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Carrie. Uh, it's it's um, a big pleasure to be talking with you. Thank you, Jasper. I like to start by asking my guests how they identify and what their pronouns are. I'm non binary, and my pronouns are they, them. What does gender euphoria mean to you? I actually felt a little bit emotional thinking about this this morning. And what gender euphoria means to me is that feeling of non-contrivement, of like of being my kind of true born self, of being real. I don't want to pitch it as like the opposite of a bad feeling, but that's what I keep coming back to is thinking about the amount of energy I spent growing up feeling like I had to serve myself up as something that felt like a contrivement. And, you know, it really did my head in. It pulled my attention away from a lot of other things that I would have, you know, like I would have loved to, for my attention to be fully focused on my passions or my interests or positive things rather than yes. eaten up by, you know, like floundering around trying to trying to be something that I'm not. So gender euphoria for me is that wonderful feeling of like, of being my true self and not having to contrive anything anymore. What would you say that that feels like? It's just like contentment and it's a feeling of connectedness with the world around me. I, I guess a lot of people who have a religious faith and like for, for just to be like transparent about that, I don't have a religious faith. I, what I hear is that, you know, you feel really connected with the world around you. And I, I guess there are lots of different ways for people to have that feeling of connectedness. But for me, gender euphoria has me feeling content. And as I walk through the park or as I walk through the city and on my, on my bike, I feel content in the way that I'm a part of the world around me. Would you say that you feel gender euphoria a lot in your day to day? Increasingly every day. <laughs> yeah. When I talk about my gender identity, I, I really like to frame it as a journey of recognition. Um, and that has me feeling a lot more forgiving and better about my childhood and my young adult life where I was moving towards something. So, you know, I can celebrate times in my life where I was still confused and kind of, I'm still feeling that confusion. As I've learned about spectrum of gender identities, I've, I've felt more and more euphoric when it comes to my own personal gender identity. When I say journey of recognition, I, I feel like that feels really good for me because not only is it being more forgiving about my past self who hadn't recognized my non-binary identity, but it also gives room for my future self who, it's just such a beautiful feeling, you know, of knowing that our communities, as, as we all get a better understanding of, of gender, that we're more accepting of the potential fluidity of gender or, you know, like in 10 years time, I might reevaluate my gender identity. It's just a really good feeling knowing there's probably some fluidity in many of us. And it's a really lovely feeling knowing that, that there's room in my brain to maybe change and change and change again. We all need to be forgiving of our past selves and open to whatever future we want to have for ourselves. 
I've been thinking a lot about these structures and systems that are set up so rigidly, and then trans and non-binary folk come around and it's like, well, actually, fuck the box, I'm gonna, like, shapeshift every day if I want to, and you can't confine me to anything, and I'll be whoever I want in the past, now, and in the future. What is a moment of gender euphoria that stands out for you? Yeah, this is this was a tricky one for me because there have been a lot of like interactions or kind of moments that have like f- that have meshed together and, f- and formed kind of a fabric that I'm really grateful for. I will say though, before I get into that moment, that when I had the and I think this is possibly when you and I first met in Te Whanganui Atara in Wellington. I was coordinating a group of volunteers for Gender Minorities Aotearoa, which is a national organisation in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, advocating for, for gender minorities, trans and non-binary and intersex. The volunteer group that I was organising, they, they peopled not only the gender centre, which was a drop-in centre, but Auntie Dana's up shop an op shop named after a really wonderful woman, Dana De Milo, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. She was a really active in the 70s and 80s, did a lot of trans trailblazing in Aotearoa. In any case, this op shop was named in her honour. All of the, the funds raised in this op shop went directly to gender minorities Aotearoa. In retrospect, well, my, you know, when I walk into Auntie Dana's today, it doesn't strike me as being very different from your average op shop, but I guess there is a distinction, and that's that we don't organise the clothes in terms of gender. We organise them, I guess, through type of garment, <laughs> uh, and we wanted to be really accommodating of um, anyone who came in and was used to navigating the gender binary in clothes shops. Through this opportunity to look after a group of volunteers, I I met a whole bunch of super cool people who got me thinking about, I had already recognised my gender identity, but I I suppose I was at the very brink of understanding about that and being really welcomed into that community with a lot of, well, with manakitanga, with um, welcome and solidarity. It was the beginning of something really special for me. So I'm really grateful for that time. And it really is a really beautiful touchstone for me. Back to your question, though, if I think if there was one kind of crystallized moment which really stands out to me, it was actually in 2016. I had left to Whanganui Atara, Wellington, and had begun ill-advised postgraduate teaching degree. I wasn't having a great time with my mental health and I had left Wellington to Melbourne, Australia and had run out of money and so had come back to where I grew up and had started this teaching degree. I was on a placement at an intermediate school. A lot of it was was nice but I really, I wasn't feeling at home, I wasn't feeling that comfortable and I really prickled when I heard that on one of our Tuesday night staff trainings, we were having someone coming in from family planning to deliver a presentation on sexuality and gender. And, you know, like I I kind of thought of the staff room as a bit of a lion's den and I really steeled myself for an uncomfortable couple of hours where some local Christchurchian was going to come in and deliver a really kind of rigid and conservative presentation about gender and sexuality. The woman who came in from family planning immediately brought into that room the sense of expertise and warmth. She had quite a powerful presence. Right from the offset, she started talking about gender in a really intersectional way. Gender outside of the binary existing culturally since the dawn of humanity, but she also talked about, from a, I guess, a scientific or an ecological perspective, how the building blocks of life have never fully operated in the binary. I was familiar with some of the concepts she was talking about, but she delivered it in such a powerful and unapologetic way that it really blew me out of the water. And 
I guess, you know, like I had that feeling of euphoria. I had that feeling of connectedness through my, my whakapapa, my ancestors, and through the planet that I live on, like all throughout history. You know, I said I'm a dinosaur enthusiast, and she was talking about the dawn of life on planet Earth. That sounds amazing. I, I see this visualization of you just like having this like brain blast moment where you're like connected to the dawn of time and all throughout <laughs> history and you are like one with the non-binariness of this planet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, that's how a, it was. That's a beautiful experience. Yeah, it was really beautiful. Yeah, and so fascinating. I would love to learn more about how the building blocks of this planet are not binary. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, um, I've been writing about in a recent piece of writing that is going to be published, actually. I've been exploring what gender and sexuality, this will sound a little bit bizarre, but the main character, Kat, has traveled back in time and is observing a triceratops. And I've envisioned this particular Triceratops as maybe a bit of an anomaly in terms of Triceratops convention and um, being really big and powerful and at first glance maybe um, appearing to be maybe a dominant male Triceratops but actually being like more of a matriarch or operating somehow in between yeah, the, the, the binary, or outside of the binary, I should say. So cool. Can't wait to read that. Is there anything that is really seeing your gender these days? Fashion and clothing. I have, I've never studied fashion design, or I'd, I don't think of myself as like super coherent when it comes to the fashion world, but... Throughout my, throughout my life, this shirt actually, I guess listeners can't, can't see it. How would you describe this, Jasper, the colors of this shirt? You look like a beautiful peacock, watercolor. <laughs> yeah. Like turquoise with purple and pink and green and orange. Like if you were to paint the peacock in flowing watercolors where everything kind of bleeds into each other. That's what yeah, I would say your shirt looks like. Such a beautiful uh, description of this. And I, you know, I love, I love this shirt because of those reasons that it, you know, it's blended and it looks like feathers or like sunlight falling on like a hydrangea or something. What do you love about being non-binary? I feel like it has given me a perspective on the world that means I really strive to, and I'm not saying I always get this right, but I really strive to be sensitive around perspective. And, you know, like if I, if something doesn't seem coherent to me at first look, coming from a marginalized perspective myself, it really has primed me to try to see things from a non-normative perspective. I am really grateful for that, and I think it really helps me undertake the work that I do within the community as, with a kind of a, a radical compassion. I love that too. And your community is so lucky to have you, and I am so lucky to have you in my community. I think Thank you for everything that you have done, continue to do, and will do in the future, I'm sure. Likewise, Jess, we're really lovely to be sitting here talking between continents. Where can people find you on the internet? Cool. So my Instagram is Donovan Carey. I would really love to plug to your listeners a really special publication, which Auckland University Press publishing in October of this year. It's an anthology of writing from the LGBTQIA plus community, also representing takatapui, which is an umbrella term for ind indigenous sexualities and genders in Aotearoa. So this is a, an anthology of writing which has over 70 contributors and covers 
contemporary writing and writing going back to 1985. Um, my Triceratops story is being published in this anthology, which is part of my connection to it. But there are this massive cohort of incredible writers from Aotearoa. Thank you for this opportunity. And, you know, I know I'm just going to be walking on a cloud for the rest of the day. Thank you so much. I feel so much euphoria to be chatting with you also. And this is such a treasure. I don't know the federal word, but to give to everybody. Thanks, Jasper. Gender Euphoria is a queer videography podcast produced by Alana Capra. Music by Jasper Lior. Find show notes and photos to go with each episode on Instagram at Gender Euphoria Pod. If you or someone you know needs to talk to somebody about gender, visit thetrevorproject.org. If you or somebody you know wants to talk to me about gender on this podcast, email info at queervideography.com. Love yourself, listen to your body, and gender boldly. Apple trees and honeybees, the ocean breeze, a really good sneeze. There's gender queer and gender fuck, non-binary and ladies who tuck. There's trans man, thank you ma'am, the girls, the gays, the days, going out for a swim in a sea of manta rays. We're all eating to poop and pooping to eat in whatever bathroom I take a seat. And we're all just humans, homos looking for love. We're all just humans, except the cats and aliens.